Welcome back to another edition of Our Walk in Christ. And today we are going to wrap up the book of Micah. So we're going to do Micah chapter 7, and we're going to do verses 8 through the end of the chapter, which is verse 20. Now, after we finish Micah, I'm going to, uh, I have a sermon that I delivered for a church that I'm going to release that out. Um, and I'm not sure next week I might put that out or I might just take a break next week and then we'll get the sermon out and then we may or may not do another break and then we are going to jump into Haggai as the next prophet we do. So stay tuned and uh, if there there will be in the next couple weeks there will be um, two, day, two weeks that there is uh, not going to be a video and in the middle of those there's going to be a sermon. I don't know exactly which order we're going to do things. I'm going into a conference next week, so I might want to um, probably just take next week completely off so I can focus on getting prepared for all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but with that, uh, we are going to uh, wrap up Micah today. Of course, last time we talked about the first uh, seven verses of Micah chapter 7, the old shall pass away. We looked at the land suffering from the unrighteousness, and then the, the uh, prophet gets into describing the wickedness uh, around the land, and then all of the systems of government are collapsing, kind of like our modern society, right? And then, of course, uh, it finally wraps up with the prophet being completely unfazed by the error surrounding him because, like Joshua, he waits for God. Now, that being said, uh, if you want to help support the channel, we do have our uh, website at ourwalkinchrist.com. You can jump on over there and uh, you can see what our latest video is and our uh, daily scriptures, and of course, our prophet series. It looks like our prophet series did not get updated properly again. YouTube playlists are doing something weird, and they're not updating properly. I'll, I'll get that fixed up in there just so that you guys have it. Of course, all the regular playlists, it's still there. It's just, for some reason, it's throwing the new videos at the bottom of the playlist. It's supposed to put them at the top, and I have no idea why. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get that fixed, though, uh, before long. And then, of course, this video will hopefully be in that spot <laughs> as we uh, move on. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and dive on into the discussion, and we're going to look at uh, start verses uh, 8 through 10. And so having a look at uh, Micah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I will fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out into the light and I will see his righteousness then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look down on her. At that time, she will be trampled down like mire in the streets. So, of course, this is the prophet coming from verse 7, moving into verse 8. The prophet is speaking about his own uh, instance here where the enemy is seeking to trample him. He's like, I'll take it, bro, because God is going to come back and vindicate me. So the people here are cast down in their sin. They are not ultimately defeated, nor, however, are they abandoned by God, leading us to the final statement that there is no ultimate defeat. For those of us who remain in Christ, there is no ultimate defeat. We are not abandoned by God. We, have, we are a remnant that is uh, established and set up. Now, uh, we have to understand, though, that when we engage in sin, we are going to be handed over for discipline. You remember this part here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. So, of course, going into the first part of chapter 5 here, the apostle is talking about a man is in their church engaging in a lot of sexual sins. Uh, he was um, basically having intercourse with a close relative, a close female relative, which is completely against the law of God. And so what he does is, is he says, hey, you need to hand him over for discipline. But it's not handing him over to never talk to him again. And it's not handing him over to say, well, you're not at all allowed here at all. It's to hand him over for discipline. 
but it is only those who are in the church that we judge. This is where we have the issue with the LGBT movement and where some places, we'll come back to me for a moment here as I set this up in their modern context. In some places, the church that says the LGBT movement, as it is outside and not entering our church walls, we have to love the people enough to share with them the gospel and preach to them the truth. And they're going to hate us and they're going to call us transphobes and homophobes and whatever else. The the reality is we love them enough to share with them the love of God. It's just that what they're doing is considered sin by God. Now, it is never our place as Christians to judge them in the sense that we shouldn't be harsh. We shouldn't be telling them what they should do. We should not be telling a pagan person to abandon their pagan ways and follow God. We need to present to them the clear gospel, and if God so chooses them and transforms their heart, teach them the ways of God. There is a very specific distinction there. But Paul is addressing this in 1 Corinthians 5, 11 to 13. I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an adulterer or a revival or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do we not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outsiders God judges? Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So bringing in to the context of the LGBT movement, if we're talking about us and our response trying to transform and reach the community for God, that is a radically different conversation than a person who comes into the church and says, I am gay and God loves me and that's okay and don't try and change me. This verse specifically speaks to that because they're living a lifestyle that the scripture very clearly says is sin. OK, and so if they are coming in to say we are members of the church by being united to Christ, if they are not willing to cast off the sin, they are to be disassociated with in fellowship until the point in time that they repent of that sin. So that's really the distinction. Once you bring that movement into the church. That is where we have the serious issue where we're trying to change behavior on that on that front. But as far as the community outside the church, not interfering with our church, we preach them the gospel of love as the approach. And that is really what's going on in this world here, because the time that Micah is preaching, it is so evil. It is so wicked. Okay. This is the time right before Hezekiah has all his reforms. We're talking about in my book, Hezekiah's prayer. I talk about the likelihood that Hezekiah was actually sacrificed to Moloch, but survived. There is a Jewish historicity which suggests this. There is legend which suggests this. And it also explains why Hezekiah is the only king who died young without some big disease like leprosy or without uh, dying in battle. Hezekiah died as a very young king for somebody who did not die in battle. Why? I think that he was physically weakened by his father sacrificing him among his brothers and sisters to the god Moloch. That's how bad he was. But as legend has, as I write in the book and Hezekiah's prayer, as legend has, his mother um, uh, bathed him in salamander blood, which was believed to save him. Now, did that practice actually save him or was it just a miraculous event? Again, there's some discussion about that, but the Talmud actually reports Hezekiah was offered up and the scripture seems to confirm that as I talk about in the book, Hezekiah's prayer. So this is the prophet that is preaching in that time when kings were sacrificing their children to the gods. This is a wicked world. And we are also in this wicked world. But the prophet in verse 7 is comforted by the fact he's waiting on God. And here in verse 8, we're getting the, the people who are casting down. Well, our approach as believers is to keep our church pure. That is what is so important. All right. But of course, it's not to permanently kick the person out because Paul had to correct them later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Suffice it for such a one as this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you would rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Paul right there is talking about the person that they excommunicated from the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
They cast him out, but they thought it was to exclude him. No, it was to hand him over to sorrow that he would repent. And now we seem to have evidence that this person had repented in the Corinthian church. Now Paul says, now that he has repented, bring him back into the fold. All right. So going back and looking at those verses 8 through 10, of course, verse 8 is the consequence of, uh, of uh, of what their sin is. Verse 9 is the repentance and that verse 10 is the restoration. So listen for these. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. This is the repentance. I will bear indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. He's repenting. He's recognizing his sin until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light. And then we get into verse 10, the restoration. And I will see his righteousness. My enemy will see. Shame will cover her who said to me. So shame will cover the enemy who says, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look on her. At that time, she'll be trampled down like mire in the streets. So these are the people who are handed over. Uh, of course, uh, the, the phrase, where is your Lord? This was uttered a few times in Psalm 42, verses 3 and verses 10. My tears have been my food all day, uh, all day and all night. While as they say all day long, where is your God? So there's a person in sorrow. They're going, why are you sad? Where's this God that supposedly loves you? And as a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? So as adversity comes upon us, recognize that God is with us. Even those in the outside of the church looking in, they see our sorrow sometimes, which God uses that to lead us to him in prayer. It's a reminder that we have to affirm for God. Right here, the psalm looks at seeking comfort from God for all the despair while the enemies taunt him for seeking God. It's very much like we see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. These are people so arrogant, they think nothing ever changes. And of course, then it does. And then they start screaming, oh, God, why is this happening? You know, <laughs> give you one guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, but what happens is they are, uh, of course, repenting and turning back. Now we pick up um, now verses 11 to 13. This is now. So Micah was preaching. Now it's God responding in verses 11 to 13. And then 14 through 17, we see that Micah is once again uh, speaking. So this is God speaking, God's voice. Uh, Micah 7, 11 to 13. It will be a day for building your walls. On that day, your boundary will be extended. It will be a day from the, which they will come to you from Assyria in the cities of Egypt, from Egypt to the Euphrates, even from the sea to sea and the mountain to mountain, and the earth will become desolate because of her inhabitants on the uh, account of the fruit of their deeds. So the kingdom is expanding. So God's telling him how this kingdom is, is expanding. He is expanding as the faithful gather together, leaving the world to sinners. This is really talking about the, the collection of believers in a, uh, and this is where we have a little bit of some, possibly some theological differences. Or is this a millennial reign? Is this a rapture that occurred? Is this, you know, and there's different theological systems and all of them can speak into this particular verse. I'm not going to take a specific position on that right here because it's not an issue we're talking about. But what's important here is that the faithful are gathering in one place and this leaves higher concentrations of evil. This is why, look at modern politics, the good people uh, who just want to learn how to live on their own and have, want to have more conservative views, they are fleeing New York and, and um, Michigan and Wisconsin and California. They're fleeing these and they're going to the Texas and they're going to the, the Tennessee. They're going to the Florida. And we're seeing a greater concentration of people. And as this is occurring, we're seeing a lot of these states where people are, are going to with conservative values, pushing out more moral law, banning abortion under many cases, whereas the other states are still allowing it. And we're seeing 
in the states like California, in the states like New York, we're seeing a concentration of evil. And in these states where people are going more conservative, we're actually seeing a lot more of a concentration of, of good from the moral perspective. Uh, I don't think the Republican Party is necessarily good. I don't think the Democratic Party is necessarily bad. I think they're they're all evilly, evil and of the world, and we don't have any real role in them. But we can't help deny seeing the the uh, the focus on the past and keeping those conservative lines and saying, hey, we're not just going to kill babies for the sake of killing babies. We're not going to move on the liberal agenda just because it's a liberal agenda. We're going to stop and put on the brakes a little bit. But we start seeing this concentration, and that's what's going on in this world is people are basically collecting together in their individual groups. And we are seeing this as our world becomes more polarized. It's hard to find places where we can sit together and actually disagree with each other on simple points and get along. I mean, even in the Linux world, we're getting too much of this, such that radical LGBT members are attacking me. I'm not even really saying anything about that community over there. Sure, we do on this channel because this is where we're talking about the scriptures. But over there, I, I've been very clear. I don't care if it's the Roe versus Wade overturning that pushes you to privacy or if you just come to it recognizing the dangers. Hey, I'm glad we're here at the same table and let's come together and say, okay, let's focus on how we can be private online. I don't care how you've arrived at your conclusion that you need to do that as long as we do that. Yet I get attacked simply because of this channel and I have these positions where I speak boldly on these fronts. Okay. And I don't talk about this stuff frequently on the other channels, if at all, which is very interesting. Yet still, that is the channel that seems to get canceled because of my personal beliefs. Very interesting. But uh, um, this verse applies to those people attempting to assault me. They're going to come together and then they're going to, um, um, they're going to figure out the desolation that's going to happen on the fruit of their deeds. But, and that's why I've been, you know, pray the whole situation to God. That's what I've been telling everybody. I don't care. Verse 11 um, the enemies are defeated by God. The preparations of the future will be achieved. In verse 12, the people will come um, and those of God to God and those of Satan to Satan. So have a look at uh, Isaiah 19, 23 through 25. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrians will come into Egypt, the Egyptians into Assyria, the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. They're gathering together. But in Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you who took the book to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. So every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation has representatives going before God because the people of God are are coming to God. That's exactly what's going on in John. Um, I don't think I have it specifically in my notes here, but in John, you know, all who come, who are, um, all who come to me, I'm going to completely mess that verse up <laughs> off the top of my head. But actually the uh, sermon I went to on church on, on Sunday, they, they covered it quite nicely. John 6, 44, we only come to God because we are chosen. And John 6, 39, all of those who were chosen by God will ultimately come to him. There you go. That's better than me stumbling over it. Summary of the sermon from Sunday, which was a absolutely mwah, beautiful sermon we we went to in this little little church presbyterian church in the middle of this town of 300 people it was a church in a boarding school which was really fascinating to see uh but that's really what what's going on here is is god has chosen all these people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation every people group and those who are chosen by god will come to him not one of them are going to be lost that is the one of those doctrines of election and the irresistible calling of God. Some of those doctrines that people don't like to talk about, but they exist. Verse 13, the earth itself begins to die. Why? Because God is withholding the common grace because all of his people are collected in one area. 
There's no need to throw common grace over the rest of the world. All the people who openly reject God himself, the believers have been extracted. Micah 3, 4. They will cry out to the Lord. He will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. And that's what's going on in the world. So God says, I'm going to gather you guys together. We're going to separate out the godly and the godless. The common grace will be removed. The land is moving into desolation. And I can't help but to think, but our current world, that's happening too right now. Because we, the entire breakdown of law and order, the entire breakdown of sheer sanity has completely collapsed in this world. So this is the part where the voice of the text switches back to the prophet Micah instead. So God was speaking. Now Micah replies, Micah 7, 14 through 17, shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession, which dwells by itself in the woodland in the midst of the fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and in Gilead as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, I will show you the miracles the nations will see and be ashamed of all of their might. They will be put, uh, they will put their hand in their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like the reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses to the Lord, our God. They will come in dread and they will be afraid before you. So you notice how the, the previous texts here, uh, look at all the references. It will be a day for building your walls on that day. Your boundary will be extended on that day you will come. There's this more of a passive tense in the voice suggesting it's from God. Whereas here you see that it's uh, it's quotes talking about your people, your scepter, your possession. So you can see that this is the prophet now speaking back to God, echoing the texts of what is happening. So look for that as you're looking at the Old Testament uh, prophecies specifically. You'll look, track those voices and it'll help you understand who is speaking to whom and why. So in, uh, in this section here, a summary of this whole section, 14 through 17, the people are directed and guided directly by God while their enemies actively seek their harm. So in verse 14, God is the shepherd. Okay. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession. Well, that is Psalm 23. This is exactly what Psalm 23 is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of the, un of the righteous for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is what he's talking about there in verse 14. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession, which dwells by itself in the woodland in the midst of a fruitful field. Of course, Bashan and Gilead, if you're unfamiliar with those, this is the land of Og, which was given to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Remember, they weren't, speci they weren't specifically given or, or told to conquer that land, but Og came out against them to fight anyway. And uh, as that had happened, uh, as that had happened, then um, uh, the uh, Og came out to fight them. They defeated them. That is the lands of, of Bashan and Gilead, which was a very fertile. So the half tribe of Manasseh came to Moses and said, hey, we really want this land. Can we take this land here? And God, Moses takes four gods. God says, hey, sure, why not? So this is that fertile land that they're talking about. Now in verse 15, great signs and miracles will accompany his people and they will be a terror to them. This is look at uh, in Joel. Of course, we did a whole series on Joel verses, um, excuse me, chapter three, verses 14 through 16. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Of course, this is talking about the uh, Armageddon. So uh, the sun and the moon will grow dark. The skies will lose their, the stars will lose their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. 
Um, yeah, that's what's talking about there in uh, verse 15, where he's really talking about the the terror of the enemies is going to multiply all of these terrors. This is miraculous events, the same type of things that happened as God fought some of Israel's battles uh, early on during their uh, during their uh, exile uh, or exodus, I should say. Verses 16 and 17, the people who are hostile to God's people, so the, the wicked who are hostile to the righteous people, they at once realize their mistake. So we have very similar imagery from Job chapter 40, verses 4 and 5. So God, remember, asks him through uh, Job 38 and Job 39 just a series of rhetorical questions, all of which indicate that Job is a meaningless little speck on the world. He was a little bit full of himself. So God finally stops for a breath, and here Job gets his word in two chapters later. Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I've spoken, and I will not answer even twice, and I will add nothing more. That is what is going to happen to the enemies of God's people as they come down and attempt to destroy them. They are going to circle around Israel, trying to wipe them out, and they are going to recognize in a hurry that Every knee will bow those on heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. That means whether you're going to go to heaven or whether you're going to go to hell, whether you're raptured and taken up to heaven while you still have a physical body or whether or not, every knee is going to bow. And all of those people who spent their life's career rejecting God, mocking Christians, are going to get on their knee before Jesus, denounce him as Lord before being cast eternally into hell. So repent now before you find yourself in that position. Because if you do not repent before that position, if you bow that knee, having never sworn an allegiance to Christ, you are going to be in hell for an eternity. Bow your allegiance to Christ today. Willingly. Now, that was, of course, was Philippians 2.20. In the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, those who have already ascended, those who are here now, those that have left behind. That is what is going to happen there. Now we wrap up the last three verses, 18 through 20. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? So of course, this is looking at the tenses. Micah is now speaking again. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us and he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and an unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from the day of old. God's love is for the remnant. Okay, the remnant people. Remember, it's those who, those who remain faithful through the, the difficult trials to come. Those who remain faithful until the very end are those who are redeemed. And God has this deep love for the remnant. Isaiah 46, 3. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and the remnant of the house of Israel. You who have been born by me from birth, and have been carried from the womb. All right, so uh, these are people who have been born from God by birth. They have been elected. They have been sovereignly chosen. Of course, Jeremiah 23, verse 2. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. So again, God speaks of this remnant. God passes over their transgressions. Why? Because they have already accepted the sacrifice of Christ. And Christ's sacrifice atones for their sin. In Romans 5, 9, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So it is the sacrifice of Christ that gives us this. Now, as far as compassion... God has mercy on us because of our standing in redemption. It is not God has mercy on us because God loves all of his, all of his human beings perfectly, equally well. 
No, some of us are born of heaven and some of us are born as hell. And the scripture specifically speaks that God has difference in his compassion. This does not make him the author of evil, as some have suggested, nor does it make him specifically um, explicitly good, explicitly bad. It makes him God. It makes him sovereign. And in Romans 9, 15 through 16, we see this. He says to Moses, God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on the God who has mercy. God has compassion. He offers us a sacrifice through Christ Jesus. That if we repent of our sins, and that is important, we repent of our sins. We recognize what we do is sinful. We repent of our sins. We turn to Christ. And then we spend our lives understanding and studying and getting into the mind and the heart of God through prayer and through Bible study. We go ahead and we get into all of that. Then uh, we recognize that a person who repents who turns to Christ is a person who is numbered among that elect. Now, we do not know who is elect and who is not, and this is why you have the command to love all people and to share the gospel and to alleviate all suffering in the world where we happen to see it. That is what the, the purpose is. And we come to this final conclusion in this book, this chapter and in this book, God is the source of compassion and comfort when we are faithful to him. Now, God does have common grace. A person who doesn't believe in God doesn't just live this horrible, wretched life. And a person who comes to God doesn't live this perfect and sanctified life. In fact, that was a form of Americanized Christianity. Just come to Jesus and all your problems will go away. No, Jesus gave us one big promise. While you're in this world, you're going to suffer. Okay, that's the promise that we have from God. So it's not that we're going to completely be free of any suffering, but he gives us the grace and the love and the compassion and the joy in our heart to survive through the greatest trials and temptations that the world will send us because they are going to send us trials and temptations in this world. But we have one duty. We are left here on earth so that we can preach the gospel and alleviate suffering wherever we can find it, and to point people to the one true compassionate God whom he will love and whom he will have compassion. So repent of your sins today and turn back to Christ. With that, uh, if you want to help support the channel, have a look over at the website. Of course, we talked briefly about the book Hezekiah's Prayer. You can have a look over here at Hezekiah's Prayer. You can actually have a look at the book Sample. Uh, you can see, whoop, I clicked the wrong button there. Uh, you can actually read the introduction to the book over here on the website, and you can see our list of scripture references that we have. And there are links if you like ebooks, print books, audiobooks. We have all of those available as well. In fact, you can listen to a five minute sample of the book uh, down here on the website as well. So you can go ahead and uh, do that as well. So you can find all that and other books that I have over on the website at ourwalkingchrist.com. With that, thanks for watching, and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk in our Lord.